I want you to imagine that you've recently been gifted with seemingly unlimited control over the media narrative of America's richest and most influential city. Furthermore, with a simple unlocking of your phone and a few quick texts, you could contact your closest family members, comfortable with the knowledge that by the next morning you could make, or break, the livelihood of almost any politician, business tycoon, or even country. Although this Machiavellian level of instant power might seem enticing to some families, the ugly truth is that not only having but also keeping such world-changing influence for a lifetime, let alone for a century, is a feat that most of us simply wouldn't have the ingredients, let's call it that, to pull it off. In today's video at Old Money Luxury, we'll be discussing one particular family dynasty that, to put it bluntly, doesn't have that problem of us mere mortals, and do in fact possess the ingredients of power. Indeed, the Salzburgers, along with their founding in-laws, the Oaks family, have owned the New York Times for an eye-watering 120-plus years, guiding America's paper of record, as they call it, through both world wars, the Great Depression and Great Recession, presidential assassinations and resignations, multiple pandemics, and into the 21st century globalized world, all while managing to keep it in the family and maintain their status as the top dogs of New York and arguably American media. However, in order to recount their meteoric rise to stratospheric power properly, we must first start at the beginning, with a saga that begins, like so many classic American rags-to-riches tales, with a little-known immigrant reaching the shores of the land of opportunity and snatching influence from the jaws of mediocrity. Our journey to the heights of media dominance begins in the seminal year of 1896, when Adolf Ox, a 38-year-old media magnate hailing from Chattanooga, Tennessee, seized possession of the New York Times, a floundering newspaper in dire need of resurgence. At the time, the once iconic newspaper's circulation had plummeted to around 9,000 copies, a paltry fraction of what its competitors were boasting, and the Times management was fraught with inefficiencies, leading to financial losses that put the paper on the brink of bankruptcy. Furthermore, the rise of yellow journalism, characterized by sensationalism and sometimes irresponsible reporting by competitors like William Randolph Hearst's New York Journal and Joseph Pulitzer's New York World, was drawing readers away. These factors contributed to the paper's loss of desirability and financial solvency, creating a ripe opportunity for someone like Adolf Aux to step in and attempt a turnaround. Born in Germany into a distinguished Jewish lineage, young Aux immigrated to American soil and soon took the world of journalism by storm, rapidly ascending through its echelons. For example, in 1884, he claimed ownership of the Chattanooga Times and fastidiously turned it into a paragon of journalistic success in the southern states. Subsequently envisioning an even grander stage for his talents, Oakes's astute media eye saw the New York Times as the quintessential American newspaper of record and thus aspired for it to gain unparalleled reverence and global readership in the coming 20th century. But Oak's ability to climb the ladders of power extended far beyond simply turning newspapers into media giants. His shrewd marriage decisions would also have a part to play in the family's monumental rise to influence. In 1900, Adolf Oak wedded the captivating Effie Wise. Far from an ordinary woman, Effie was the daughter of Rabbi Isaac Meyer Wise, an American Jewish luminary. Joining hearts and uniting empires, Effie ushered Oaks into the orbit of her affluent uncles, Cyrus and Ferdinand Salzberger, formidable pillars in the spheres of cotton trade and jurisprudence, respectively. Given their previous experience in commerce, Cyrus and Ferdinand Salzberger were no strangers to the machinations of business and power. Recognizing the potential to extend their influence and prestige, the Salzburgers invested both financial resources and social capital into Adolf's vision for the New York Times, becoming stakeholders in its success. Now to resurrect the Times name and financial stability, the Oaks Salzberger gents implemented a multi-pronged approach. Oaks focused on raising the journalistic standards, eschewing the sensationalism that characterized much of the era's press while Cyrus and Ferdinand invested in new printing technologies to improve efficiency and lower costs. Additionally, the Salzberger brothers leveraged their social and business networks to secure advantageous advertising contracts and facilitated exclusive interviews and scoops, all while simultaneously clearing its debt 
and positioning it as a serious publication committed to journalistic integrity. Riding this string of business victories by 1904, the New York Times had moved its operations to an imposing edifice in Longacre Square, standing as the tallest structure in the metropolis and signaling the paper's soaring ambitions. Such an auspicious relocation led to the square's eventual rechristening as Times Square, a monumental site that became synonymous with the vibrant pulse of New York City. Even better for the family of burgeoning media tycoons, in 1913, the New York Times was lavished with its first Pulitzer Prize for public service, specifically for its unparalleled coverage of the tragic sinking of the Titanic, further increasing the paper's reputation as a guardian of journalistic excellence. Entering the Roaring Twenties, the familial networks of Oaks and the Sulzbergers intertwined even more deeply in the intricacies of the New York Times, with Arthur Hayes Sulzberger, Adolf's industrious son-in-law, affiliating himself with the paper in 1918, with Arthur's swift ascent within the company culminating in his becoming the publisher in 1935, and additional members from both prestigious families enrolling in the publication's operations during this period. Thus, by the decade's end, the New York Times was securely helmed by the united visions of the Oaks and Sulzberger clans, undertaking diverse roles from reporting and editing to publishing. However, this up-and-coming power family would soon face challenges and temptations that not even their vast wealth and influence could easily conquer. Could the integrity of the Ox Sulzberger's cash cow newspaper withstand the seismic shifts of a society on the brink of World War II, political upheaval, and technological revolution? In the transformative year of 1935, Arthur Hayes Sulzberger, Adolf Ox's aforementioned son-in-law, assumed the role of publisher for the New York Times, inheriting the monumental legacy and vision for journalistic supremacy. Sulzberger was an unwavering sentinel for press freedom and navigated the paper through an epoch marked by monumental global happenings, spanning from the tumultuous tides of World War II, the ideological entanglements of the Cold War, to the divisive quagmire of the Vietnam War. However, not content with mere domestic triumph, Sulzberger had further propelled the paper into the international arena, inaugurating overseas bureaus in the hopes of furnishing a balanced, thorough coverage of global events. At the cornerstone of the Sulzberger dynasty was Iphigenie Ox Sulzberger, Arthur's indomitable wife and the child of Adolf Ox. Her role in the family enterprise was far from ornamental. She was an integral member of the board of directors for the New York Times Company for an extensive period. Additionally, her influence permeated the newspaper's managerial echelons. A fervent advocate for women's empowerment, Iphigenie ensured the elevation of women to commanding roles within the newspaper's infrastructure, and her philanthropic interests also extended into the realms of arts and education, reinforcing the family's wider societal impact. Therefore, as we can see, the Orcs Sulzberger dynasty had, in the span of just two generations, followed the old money family playbook of strategic intermarriage, placing family members in key positions of influence and extending their financial clout from the local to the global arena. Now, in 1967, the formation of the New York Times Company heralded an era of diversification and expansive growth. Though the venture went public, the reins of power were still firmly clutched by the Salzburger lineage. The corporation branched into a multifaceted media conglomerate, adding radio and television stations, along with magazines, to its burgeoning empire. Furthermore, in the year of 1971, under the vigilant guardianship of the Sulzberger family, the New York Times took an audacious leap in journalistic valor by publishing the Pentagon Papers, classified government documents laying bare the obscured realities of the Vietnam War. This publication sent seismic shockwaves through the corridors of power, culminating in a titanic legal clash between the Nixon administration and the newspaper. When the dust settled, it was seen a triumph for the First Amendment, as the Supreme Court sided with the venerable institution of the New York Times. The same pivotal year also saw the newspaper grapple with labor strikes, orchestrated by the Newspaper Guild, representing the journalists and staff. These strikes crippled the paper's operations for months, suspending publication on multiple occasions. 
This crucible not only disrupted the newspaper's workflow, it additionally served as a moment of reckoning for the Schulzberger family, bringing to light limitations on their hereditary dominion over New York media, and prompting questions about whether or not the family would ruin their then decades-long chain of generational wealth preeminence. The Sulzbergers answered the call for financial innovation in 1976 by taking the New York Times company public. The sale of shares to external investors yielded an immediate influx of capital, albeit at the cost of diluting the family's controlling stake. This strategic move also instituted a new governance structure, making the company answerable to its shareholders who could now elect the board of directors, thereby adding layers of corporate accountability. And in the 1980s, the Sulzbergers continued their strategic plays to ensure the paper's relevance and financial stability. Capitalizing on the burgeoning 24-hour news cycle, they acquired several smaller regional newspapers and media outlets to diversify their portfolio. With the launch of new sections like Science Times and investment in investigative journalism, the paper further positioned itself as an intellectual authority, not merely a general newspaper of record. Towards the end of the third generation of Ox Sulzberger ownership of the New York Times, the family had learned some key lessons on how to maintain both generational wealth and monumental global power. They had learned to take calculated business risks, such as the controversial publishing of the Pentagon Papers, and later their Pulitzer Prize winning bet on their coverage of the Watergate scandal. They showed a fearless tenacity to face technological advances head-on, such as their early adoption of computerized typesetting in the 1970s, which reduced production costs and increased efficiency. Finally, like many old money families that keep their wealth for generations, they strategically acquired other media assets, such as their eventual purchase of the Boston Globe in 1993, helping to diversify their portfolio and spread financial risk. Now, entering the stage in 1997 was Arthur Sulzberger Jr., the fourth-generation torchbearer of this journalistic dynasty. His tenure commenced in an era of digital disruption and waning print profits. Undeterred, Sulzberger Jr. spearheaded a modernization initiative that would fortify the paper's footing in the 21st century. Investments poured into enhancing digital capabilities and restructuring the print edition streamlining the number of pages while incorporating vibrant color schemes. These reformative strides yielded fruit. The New York Times metamorphosed yet again into a resilient, financially robust global news entity. However, this seemingly advantageous digital shift for the Sulzberger's golden goose laid the seeds of potential destruction for the family's empire. For as we all have learned, many of the lessons of the 20th century became useless platitudes and moot points in the face of a rapidly changing 21st century. And what would happen next could crush even the most shrewd of old money families like the Salzburgers. On a seemingly tranquil September morning in 2001, New York Times editors sipped their coffees, clueless to how in just a few short hours, the most shocking event in American history since the Kennedy assassination was about to unfold before their very eyes on global television. Under the stewardship of the Sulzbergers, the Times quickly grasped the magnitude of the 9-11 attacks. Commercial planes hijacked by terrorists crashing into the World Trade Center's Twin Towers in New York City and the Pentagon in Washington, D.C. This unparalleled act of terror led to the immediate loss of thousands of lives and had a profound impact on national security and foreign policy. Simultaneously, the Times editorial team sprang into action deploying reporters and photographers to the scenes of destruction and working tirelessly to try to provide comprehensive, reliable coverage during a moment of national crisis. In that pivotal year, a staggering six Pulitzer Prizes for journalism were bestowed for New York Times pieces linked to the 9-11 attacks or subsequent anti-terrorism efforts, solidifying the Times' role as a vigilant observer of human conditions. Fast forward to 2003, as the newspaper grapples with its first major ethical quagmire in quite a while. Reporter Jason Blair is caught in a web of deceit. Plagiarism and fabrications mar his contributions. The incident leaves the paper's reputation in jeopardy and prompts serious questions about its editorial rigor. In the aftermath, the newspaper jettisons Blair, issues public apologies and ushers in reforms to fortify its editorial sanctity. 
enhanced standards and augmented editorial staff became the new watchwords. Come 2008, and another crisis looms. This time, the financial scaffolding of Wall Street crumbles. Amid an era where venerable publications collapse like dominoes, the Salzburgers navigate the New York Times with cautious skill through tumultuous economic currents. Although difficult decisions like workforce reductions are inevitable, their commitment to journalistic quality provides an invaluable service to readers, safeguarding the newspaper's resilience. The year 2011 heralds yet another paradigm shift. Print journalism is on the wane, and a digital vortex beckons. Faced with a crucial decision, the Salzburgers opt for a digital subscription model. Despite initial skepticism, this audacious move proves transformative, not only enhancing revenue, but becoming a blueprint for the industry, reinforcing the Times' bulwark against digital disruptions. More recently, 2015 marks the advent of A.G. Salzberger, a youthful inheritor of an august legacy. Young in age but steely in resolve, he perceives digital subscriptions not as an adjunct, but as an imperative. AG embarks on a digital renaissance, amplifying online presence, deploying innovative technologies and tailoring adaptive strategies. Under the leadership of AG Salzberger, the Times witnessed an unparalleled surge in its subscription base, amassing over 8 million loyalists across its print and digital platforms during earth-shattering moments like the COVID-19 pandemic and the 2020 US presidential election. Yet, lurking behind this resurgence in success, the New York Times was quickly racking up a controversial us against them tag to its reporting practices as independent journalism and distaste for what many have seen as biased coverage started to shake the very foundations of what the Times and the Salzburgers had built their name upon, journalistic integrity. Indeed, any conversation about the New York Times and the Salzburger family that sidesteps the paper's recent series of controversies would be glaringly deficient. Over the last seven to eight years, the Times had found itself mired in multiple quagmires that heightened questions about its once legendary journalistic integrity. Take 2015, for example. A comprehensive study accused the Times of unabashed national bias during the Iranian nuclear crisis, contending that it outright minimized the United States' involvement. This was seen as no mere oversight. It was purported to be a failure to present a balanced view. Then jump to 2021, when another scholarly investigation hammered the Times for its persistent bad news bias. More than just a question of tone, the study asserted that the Times' coverage was more negatively tinted than that of any other major publication examined, including scientific journals and international outlets, with the implication of the studying being that the Times had perhaps made a deliberate editorial choice to amplify negativity. But unfortunately for the family, the controversies haven't ended there. In a courtroom drama with Project Veritas, a conservative activist group, the Times found itself on the receiving end of a temporary publishing ban issued by a New York judge. Indeed, this was no trivial matter. The newspaper stood accused of exceeding journalistic boundaries by directly quoting confidential legal documents. Furthermore, throughout the Trump administration, criticisms of bias reached fever pitch. The Times was said to not just be reporting the news, to many it appeared to be taking sides, adding fuel to an already polarized public discourse. Still ensconced in the eye of this multifaceted storm is the Orchs Sulzberger dynasty, the indomitable captains at the newspaper's helm. Commanding a monopoly on the voting shares of the New York Times Company, their imprint on the newspaper's journalistic ethos and commercial strategy is inextricable. While detractors decry this as a hegemonic stranglehold, contending that such familial dominion imperils the newspaper's much-vaunted impartiality, the Salzburgers advocate that their stewardship serves as the bulwark defending the paper's editorial sanctity. Regardless of which side of the coin you land on, it is clear that the Ox Salzburgers' leadership of the New York Times for more than a century has been nothing short of remarkable. An unending reign of power plays, shrewd familial transitions, and calculated business moves that could teach us all a little bit more about how it feels to run an old money media empire. And now we'd love to see you in the comments. How do you feel about the fact one family has ruled over America's most famous newspaper for over 120 years? Is that evidence of a secure and thoughtful stewardship of the news, or is there something more sinister at play? We look forward to hearing from you.
And if you're passionate about New York's most powerful families, why not click the video on screen to check out our deep dive on the Rockefellers, perhaps the most well-known family dynasty in the entire Empire State. We'll see you there or below in the comments, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Old Money Luxury.